Uh, any other witnesses on this bill? Uh, Senator, uh, perhaps you can respond to some of the concerns that have been raised and <coughs> what's the next steps on this bill? And we'll Should have some we, uh, questions. Perhaps Senator Roth, who is a pilot, might start off the discussion and I'd be happy to fill in any blanks at that point. I do have a Senator list Roth, of responses. Questions? And Senator Leva. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sort of confused by the, some of the comments, and maybe it's because I'm misinformed. I thought the Federal Aviation Agency's authority to regulate started at, what, 400 feet above the surface? Mr. Chairman, Senator, um, so the Federal Aviation Administration asserts jurisdiction from the ground up. What's called the integrated airspace, national airspace, begins at 500 feet, but any airspace that is navigable, and in this case, all drone flights for recreational use are supposed to be below 400 feet. The FAA asserts jurisdiction over that airspace as well. Uh, and again, the California Aeronautics Act does not distinguish uh, between altitudes. So with respect to the FAA regulations that are proposed, are they going to regulate from the surface up? Uh, yes, sir. I, I, already the FAA uh, has issued new regulation um, regulating commercial flight up to 400 feet. Uh, anything above 400 feet would require special exemption from the FAA because you enter uh, manned airspace. And what about recreational use? Uh, recreational use is um, governed by FAA guidelines as well as industry guidelines uh, that generally uh, would not promote flight above 400 feet and always uh, do, would avoid any interference with manned air flight. But not regulations? Uh, no, so federal statute very specifically allows for hobbyist use. So the, the F FAA is not proposing regulations from the surface to 400 feet? Uh, they are they are proposing rules governing commercial flight up to 400 feet. Well, I'm concerned about recreational use. And recreational use is governed by the FAA's guidelines up to 400 feet. They don't, they're not currently proposing a specific rulemaking on hobbyist use. So there, no, there, there will be no regulations on rec recreational use from the surface to 400 feet. Uh, sorry, Senator, I, I don't want to suggest there will be no regulation as aircraft. Uh, these devices are already governed. Guidelines are not regulation. Uh, no, understood, sir, but um, uh, they would be governed by the FAA's general regulations regarding, for instance, interference with manned aircraft and the like. As to a specific new rulemaking regarding hobbyist use, no, that's not currently under consideration to my knowledge. So to the extent that the FAA promulgates a regulation that becomes final, um, that's preemptive, right? I think the FAA would suggest as much, yes. Okay. To the extent the FAA does not promulgate a regulation, and the state does, there would be nothing to stop the state from adopting regulations to govern the use of unmanned vehicles, let's say from the surface to 400 feet, correct? The FAA has issued a guidance memo to states that does, among other things, suggest, uh, as Doug quoted from, that actually state regulation of, na of airspace actually does pre pre present, among other things, safety concerns. The FAA has specifically clarified, and DJ I would be supportive of this, that state laws that governs, for instance, nuisance, harassment, uh, threat to life and limb, that's very clearly state jurisdiction and would not be, be, pre be preempted by federal law. But if the FAA doesn't step up and the state is more restrictive, then there would be nothing to stop the state from doing that. Right. Uh, uh, I, I would beg to disagree, Senator. Again, I, I believe the FAA has asserted uh, jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction, and uh, both, again, the California Aeronautics Act and Supreme Court cases have found that, in general, na air, the navigation of airspace in the United States is exclusively federal jurisdiction. Well, I, okay. So, what do you object specifically about what this bill does with respect to? operating a drone within 500 feet of critical infrastructure if you're at 300 feet. Do you object to that? Uh, sir, I, I don't object to the interference with safe operation of critical infrastructure, which is an approach a number of states have taken. Um, uh, DJI is greatly concerned about restrictions on airspace that, again, might would conflict with federal guidance, specifically because this law does not address intent, malice, or harm. Rather, it addresses flight. And I think that if the law were to say that interference with the safe operation of critical infrastructure is illegal under California law, you would get no objection from industry. I think prohibiting flight blankets, and in particular without permission that does not exist from the FAA, uh, again, that permission isn't obtainable today, that we do object to. 
I wish that his statements were accurate, but I would respectfully disagree with his analysis here. The interference itself under federal regulations with commercial flight is a violation. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I'd let you proceed, but there, there's a point at which we have a, uh, I don't know if we provided it, but we have a state and local regulation of un unmanned aircraft systems fact sheet that was presented by the Federal Aviation Administration, which clearly indicates that the areas from 400 feet and below uh, are definitely uh, within the purview, uh, or that the, I should say, the state does have jurisdiction at that point. So. Uh, and I will offer that up so that uh, the disagreements I have with the gentleman here, uh, you can decide for yourselves. But I would respectfully disagree. At, at this point, I think when we, we have absolute statements made that I believe are inaccurate, it, uh, it diverts the, the uh, debate and uh, marginalizes what should be a, a valid, robust discussion about the issue. So I will provide a copy of this Thank to you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll um, yeah. I have a question about the insurance and a suggestion, but before I get to that, I mean, I, I have to tell you that I'll be supporting this bill. Um, as a pilot, um, I would hate to have one of these things come through my windscreen. And um, we're not supposed to be below 500 feet, that's absolutely true, except on takeoff and approach to airports. But uh, there was a recent report in the LA Times, I don't know how accurate, of a pilot in a Cessna over the city of Riverside who spotted a drone at 9,200 feet. Now, I didn't know they flew that high, but if in fact somebody can get one up there, that's where we are. So um, I'm very concerned about that. Now to my, my question uh, of the author. The, the bill with respect to commercial insurance does not appear to address um, self-insurance, and I would assume that some of these large um, corporations self-insure for certain types of risk. Maybe it's implicit in here, but I would ask is, to the extent this moves forward uh, that you consider the issue of self-insurance and how you set up um, rules and regulations to permit corporations with the financial capability to do so uh, to self-insure against this risk as I assume they do on, on other the, risks. The purpose of the insurance with commercial uh, is that there are, we, we acknowledge there are incidents where there are accidents that happen in the same way with a, an automobile that you have to have insurance to uh, address those problems. I think we certainly can, and, and it was indicated by the witness, we are working with the insurance industry to try to create products that will address that problem. The concern truly is what happens if there is an incident uh, and there are damages and injury and so forth, who is going to be responsible for that? Right, but in the, in, for example, in the workers' comp area, some corporations procure sure. workers' comp insurance, sometimes they self-insure, and they're permissibly self-insured and there are ways to structure that, whether it's rules, regulations, bonding capacity or whatever. I just ask that you at least take a look at yes. that. And that is what we are discussing with state uh, farms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Reasonable uh, question. Really well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, gentlemen, all of you referred to uh, the fact that this bill would deter innovation. So I was wondering if you could tell me specifically how it would deter innovation. I, I think one example would be it would prohibit all flight in Sacramento, as an example. So within five miles of any airport, mm -hmm. uh, broadly defined in the act, uh, without FAA permission to fly near an airport, which does not exist for recreational users, for instance, um, that would ground all drones outside of large commercial operations. And I, I think that from our perspective, uh, it, this state would be the first to, dis to prohibit flight uh, in that manner, which I think could broadly be considered to discourage all innovation. But what is innovative about that? How does that stifle innovation? I mean, maybe I have a different understanding of innovation. To me, innovation is new technology, new things that we're going to do. Just saying that these particular drones can't fly in a certain airspace or in a certain area, I don't understand how that causes a deterrence to innovation. Sure, well, and another way to, to look at that is through the provision of this bill that would empower the Department of Transportation to uh, regulate drones and, and drone operators. and. Um, we simply cannot have um, a, a, that innovation-friendly national policy framework functioning well, just as it has with manned aviation, if there's this looming threat of state and local piecemeal regulation and a fractured airspace, which the FAA says would undermine safety, which is what all this is about. So it's not only, I would say, about protecting innovation, it's about protecting and upholding 
the safety of the national airspace. I, and I would, I would concur, Senator, and I guess I would just offer that with any other device, automobiles, for instance, if we prohibited use of automobiles within five miles of an airport, um, I think you would be likely to not see Tesla set up shop in California. Uh, and again, several of the companies represented here today do their research and development in California. And if our devices can't be used here, I think it is safe to assume that that will sufficiently dissuade uh, innovative invest investment in innovation uh, in this state. I think that's an apples to orange comparison, but thank you. Other questions from senators? Uh, Senator Wachowski. I'm um, sorry I had to go to this Judiciary Committee. On state parks, mm -hmm. I'm having troubles being persuaded by your federal preemption. The federal government says that no drones can drive, fly over national parks. Is this body supposed to wait for consensus with Rhode Island and Alabama about whether we should prohibit drones from go, going over state parks? I mean, I, I, I'm following your argument about we, the innovation we want to do. I don't see how drones are not, there's no innovation goes on if we decide you can't fly over state parks or uh, fish and game areas. Explain that to me. Senator, a number of states, for instance, have prohibited uh, using existing state jurisdiction uh, takeoff or recovery from uh, parks, and I don't think that anyone here at this table would suggest that that's preempted by federal law. Um, and so, uh, to the, I mean, again, just as a, a state park can prohibit skateboarding or open burn pits, um, absolutely, we think that California would be well, certainly empowered uh, to prohibit takeoff and landing within state parks. As to navigable airspace, um, in the same way that uh, I don't think California generally is empowered under existing law. Uh, to prohibit overflight of state parks using helicopters. Um, again, this is, to your point about Alabama, it's well taken, but as a historical and legal matter, the federal government has generally uh, plotted airspace across state lines. But how dare the federal government say, our national parks are protected from activity, but, I mean, sue me. Let, if, I, if I don't want drones to go over state parks and, and, and say, let's say there's legitimate uh, uh, disagreement, we're, ta we're trying to talk about our balancing the, the interest that we have and why people actually go to, if they actually go to the state parks, right? There actually uh, is a mechanism, uh, Senator, for, uh, for instance, the Department of Fish and Wildlife to request uh, a temporary flight restriction, is, uh, a TFR is what it's called. So for instance, Disneyland has successfully petitioned the FAA to establish a no-fly zone over Disneyland. Uh, that mechanism is available uh, to the Department of Fish and Wildlife or anything of the sort, which is to say that, uh, again, you don't, I don't think, have to wait for Alabama or Rhode Island. If the state is concerned about overflight of state parks, there are mechanisms available under federal law that would allow for that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Senator, Senator Mendoza, Senator Roth again. Yeah, Senator Mendoza. Um, well, I want to thank the author for I made a few clarifications with regards Senator to the, Bates after. the insurance part of it. I think that's uh, it's good to know the uh, commercial um, drones. Uh, I know that there's several concerns that are raised. Um, first, how, how did you come up with a five mile radius from the airport? How did you come up with that? Because I, 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 we live in an urban area, so uh, that's a lot of families that are near the airport that will never be able to have a drone or ever use one. So, and then, and if they can't fly a uh, drone near the airport, then they can't. If they want to go to a state park and use, they can't fly use it there either. So we're gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna. Well, again, these are for safety concerns. The five miles has been established by the FAA as a an area where there there needs to be protection uh, five miles from an airplane, so that we can avoid the potential for um, uh, for crashes. Uh, and I think Senator Roth is a as a pilot is acutely aware of the possibility these things can inter if they interfere with an airplane in flight they can cause a crash. And so that is the reason, again, we are mirroring what the FAA has determined to be a safety zone, if you will. So the, recurrently, the FAA recently, I know I think they did that last year, I believe they set, they set up a, was it a five year, I mean, five mile five radius miles. from That's there, they could, no drones can be within. Okay. M Mr. Chairman, if I may, just, just to clarify, Senator, the FAA's current regulations require notification that is before correct. flight within five miles. That is correct. Your and point about built up in urban areas, the FAA does currently allow, federal law currently allows flight within five miles, including in urban areas, as long as you have successfully notified the tower, which gives the tower the ability to warn you if you were going to interfere with manned flight. This law would prohibit Right. Flight within five miles. Right. Um, no, that is. Listen, th listen. I want to tell you it's something. It's not quite correct. You don't you don't speak until you request me to allow you to speak. Apologies, Mr. That's Chairman. That's the way it works. Okay, Senator. It is not an outright prohibition. 
You just, you need to call the tower. You need to get the permission of the tower. So they know that if you're flying a drone, there's not an airplane that is about to try to take off or land in that area. And the question is, to whom do we give the greater respect, if you will, to an airplane, usually with people on board, or to an unmanned aerial vehicle that for whatever reason, particularly if someone just feels like flying one, that they that they are not impeding or impairing or threatening the lives and property of others. I mean, I think that's just a common sense approach here. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll answer other questions as Senator I ask. Senator Roth and uh, Senator Bates, please. So, He's asking you a question. Go ahead. What happens if there's no tower? I'm sorry. In terms of requests, uh, notifying the tower? Well, what happens? And there are many airports in the state of California and states across the country where there is no operating control tower. Mm -hmm. And there are no air traffic controllers. And pilots know how to do it because you use a common frequency and you communicate as you move around the pattern and as you approach the airport so other Pilots in other planes know where you are, you report your position, you look out, see and avoid and all that. So what happens if you don't have a flight restriction around an airport and there's no tower? So, uh, Senator, that's actually precisely why the uh, Association of Airport Executives, uh, the FAA and industry have worked to develop this digital notification system because the question of towerless airports or overlapping tower five mile radiuses um, is an important question, which is exactly why the notification uh, requirement is being digitized. So it's no longer a question of having to call a tower. What digital, what do you do? How do, how do you notify people? So uh, what's being done is the uh, AAAE, the airport executives uh, and industry are building into the flight software of drones, uh, the ability to digitally notify any, uh, air, any airport operator within a five mile radius of flight. So, I, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm having difficulty understanding how I would get that notification if I was approach, if I happen to be approaching an airport without a tower. How would I know that? You as a pilot? Yes. So in a in a towerless environment, there are, as you would know well, sir, I mean, the general aviation already has rules governing how to approach a tower with uh, uh, a landing field without a tower. Well, I know that, but I don't know that the drone knows that. So how does the drone deal with that? So that's what we're building into the software, sir. So so rather than an individual operator having to know all of that, being built into the software in a, in collaboration with the airport executives in California, the drone knows that because we're building it into the software. Okay, well, I'm not, I won't, that makes no sense to me, but that's okay. The five miles, within five miles of an airport, uh, do you propose a different radius? Now, I do understand that as pilots, we step down and we're at different altitudes as we approach or leave airports. And so are you suggesting that the radius should be three miles or two miles or? No, no, sir. I think the five miles is the radius that's been established in federal law. Um, I think where we disagree with the senator is simply whether or not um, there is a permission requirement or whether there is a notice requirement uh, under federal law. There is a notice requirement, which is different than what's in this law. This and, and again, I understand the towered airports. I do not understand the explanation at uncontrolled airports, but we can deal with that offline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Bates, please. Senator Bates. Thank you. Um, I think my problem, and I, I applaud the senator from Santa Barbara dealing with this over, you know, a couple of sessions here because of the privacy issues. But to me, we have to bring a balance in terms of public safety, privacy, all of those issues, and also innovation. And I do believe uh, in the presentations that have been made to me on innovation, I certainly lean in that direction. When you have something as prescriptive as this, uh, you have the government involvement and the manner in which these new uh, tools can be used that benefit the public is where you start to get constrained. And I think that's what you're talking about. Because if you have so many uh, ifs, ands, and buts, and the uh, you know, conflict with federal law and state law, you start to constrain those who would be looking at this particular new technology as a way to address many issues, be that public safety over uh, our force, then, you know, if there's uh, weevils in there, whatever it's looking for that the human can't find uh, with the current methods we have, this is a new technology that can really help us. So I'm, I'm in the camp that doesn't want to constrain you at this point in time with this particular bill, 
but I think it does raise a huge issue in terms of the way they're used <coughs> and the invasion of privacy and, the, uh, and actually putting public safety in certain circumstances at great risk. So we look to you, uh, certainly I'd like to see more work, uh, the Senator do more work in terms of trying to address that balance because I think we all find ourselves in both sides of this issue. But today I'm going to lean with uh, what I consider to be the innovative side of this new technology that can be a great benefit uh, to uh, certainly our communities and certainly to uh, the public as a whole. Okay, Senator Jackson. Uh, Thank you. Other comments? Uh, you have the floor to Thank you. Let, let me try to respond. I, I have to admit, I, uh, like Senator Roth, didn't totally understand the arguments in opposition to the bill. I do want to emphasize, as Senator Leva questioned, where are we, wh how are we stifling innovation? Uh, in the example I used about in agricultural fields, there's nothing in this bill that stifles the use of these vehicles in, in, for innovation there. If, if, uh, if a, uh, Drone. If a commercial drone wants to fly uh, and uh, sort of memorialize an area um, by flying a drone uh, over private property, all they have to do is get that permission. Um, if it's if it's within the confines of this legislation, part of this uh, there is nowhere that I could see where we are stifling innovation by limiting access of a drone to an area where people may be flying an airplane, where there is a five mile radius that the federal government has already determined is appropriate. This bill limits flying drones within 500 feet of critical infrastructure, within a thousand feet of a heliport and within five miles of an airport without permission. You need to get permission. Why? Because there is the potential for a dangerous event, a, a serious public safety problem. This doesn't stifle innovation. It limits disruptive drone use near private property. Private property, the right of privacy, the right of pro to, to, to be able to have some control over your own property. These are fundamental rights that we he have here in California written right into our Constitution. So if it's flying a drone or having a right of privacy, this legislation, this public policy says the, the priority is going to be over our constitutionally protected right. But it doesn't limit the use of drones in other aspects. It limits drone use over state parks because if we here in California as a matter of public policy, want people to be able to enjoy public parks without the prospect of a drone flying up in your face when your goal is to get out into the wilderness, to com co commune with nature, to have some peace and quiet, to watch wildlife in a respect so that they don't feel as though they're being threatened by a predatory drone, which is what... Wildlife doesn't know what a drone is. They see it as a predator with something flying, buzzing overhead, and it frequently traumatizes the wildlife. This is an invasion of our space. This is a threat to wildlife. And the, the priority that we've stated here in California as public policy with this bill is that we are going to prioritize for this, but we are not stifling innovation that doesn't have these kinds of impeding uh, elements to it. Uh, the state capital. Uh, think about that for a minute. We've actually even had uh, over the White House and I believe over the state capitol a drone that crashed onto the property certainly surrounding the White House and we believe also there was an incident right here on uh, in the capitol. And if you know, we have a lot of children. We have a lot of people who come here to, to speak and to uh, demonstrate and to, and to exercise their fundamental rights. And we want to continue with that priority. We are prioritizing that. But we are not stifling innovation with the use of drones. Prohibits the weaponization of drones. I, I won't even argue. I, ho I hope that they don't argue that that uh, it stifles innovation. Uh, reckless operation of drones. The respectful, responsible operation of drones is something that we encourage, but we are not going to encourage the reckless operation of drones or drones interfering with manned aircraft. And we want commercial drone operators, and we will work uh, with State Farm and other insurance entities to provide some kinds of assurances that if drones do cause accidents, that actually it won't be the public that ends up taking, uh, having to bear the burden, uh, but that a commercial drone operator, an excellent suggestion by Senator Roth, which actually we are working on. So again, we want to, um, 
recognize and balance, which I believe we are doing, and I, and I appreciate Senator Bates. I know you yourself have had an experience with drones and invasion of privacy, as have I, which is what kind of turned me uh, to this whole issue, and so have many of you. And the fact that we've had 254 near misses uh, with aircraft over the last couple of years, the stories about the use of drones, the, the fact that we're going to see more of them, we need to have some kinds of reasonable, balanced regulation. And and with that, I hope that I've answered the questions that you've, uh, you've inquired about here. Um, and I would respectfully disagree. Look, if we are preempted by the federal government, uh, then we will find out about it through litigation. That's usually how these issues are resolved. If we wait for the feds to act, we could be waiting uh, until, you know what, freezes over, given what's happening. On the other hand, the federal government has created, promulgated some rules, and they'll be coming out with some more, but in the meantime, they have also indicated that there are areas that they are not going to cover, and those are the areas that we have identified and that this bill addresses. They are leaving to the states certain abilities to control uh, um, from within, lower than either four or 500 feet. We're not totally clear. Uh, it's either 400 or 500. I am happy to work with and respect and defer to federal preemption. I understand it. I, I'm a recovering lawyer. I know all about that stuff from my days in law school, um, but that, this bill is designed to, to work in areas that the federal government is not ceding, uh, or is ceding jurisdiction, I should say, to the states. That's what this bill is all about, and I would respectfully ask for your I vote. Hey, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, we don't have a motion on the floor, I don't believe. No. There's, a, there's a motion on the floor. Uh, Senator, um, uh, since I met uh, Senator Jackson uh, discussing this issue, I, you know, there, there is um, some opposition um, in the Silicon Valley to this. Um, and I, I've talked to you um, in depth about this uh, issue and understand why you feel strongly. Uh, however, I think it's really important for uh, the tech community to work with Senator and encourage all parties to sit down and talk and, you know, be reasonable about coming up with some um, solutions. Um, and I would look forward to that, sir. I, I think that uh, technology regulation is very uh, difficult. Um, um, I understand there are difficult issues here, but I, but I really would like to see the discussions take place. This is the first committee. There's going to be um, another hearing in public safety, and then it comes back to appropriations. Uh, which several of us sit on. Um, when, when I, when I, uh, I want to remind senators, when you talk about innovation, um, what you're talking about is the word, you think of the word unknown. You don't know what the innovation will lead to, so you have to look at it that there is some unknown thing, that, thing that's out there sometime when you talk about innovation, like what technology will develop and where we go with the technology. So um, when people are working in that field, um, they realize that and it's difficult to deal with um, government regulation when we're looking ahead to the future to an unknown. So I, I think that's worthy of discussing and I think that we want to balance that with the need for safety in our community and privacy and all those issues that we're trying to deal with here. So uh, I just wanted to make that statement before we vote today. Thank you. So we have a motion. Um, thank you. you just, I, I was just chairing the elections committee. My very quick comment is um, I'm definitely supporting the bill today. I, I just personally appreciate the work that you've been doing with our folks from the motion picture and TV and film production industry to make sure that we're uh, you know, respecting their important work that's such an important part of our economy, and I appreciate all the work that your staff has been having with them. Thank you, Senator Allen, and I assure you we will continue the conversations, and I look forward to working with the industry uh, to address their concerns. Okay, we have um, a vote. Please call the roll, please. The motion is do pass and refer to the Committee on Public Safety. Senator Bell? Aye. Bell, aye. Canella? No. Canella, no. Allen? Aye. Allen, aye. Bates? No. Bates, no. Gaines? Galgiani? Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. McGuire? 
McGuire, I. Mendoza. Mendoza, I. Roth. Aye. Roth, I. Wykowski. We have seven votes in favor, uh, two, two opposed. Um, and I'm voting right. Okay, um, it's seven to two, the uh, motion passes. Thank you, Senator Bell and members. Senator Gaines is absent today. Um, I'd like to uh, call Senator Mendoza, or, or Senator Glazier is here, I believe. We'll have a non-committee member. Senator Glazier, you're welcome, and uh, you have the floor on item five. This is SB 1128, uh, community commute benefit policies. Uh, Senator, you have the floor. Thank 